All right, all right. Well, I would like to thank all of you for uh, coming here today for uh, the second of the Whitehall Lectures by Dr. Greg Trickett. Uh, today, his discussion is on, I'm reading a good title, Idealism, Divine Language, and the Fact-Value Distinction, Reenchanting a Fractured World. Uh, Dr. Greg Trickett is a Associate Professor of Philosophy here at Weatherford College. He's been here for 10 years, uh, full-time. Uh, he has a uh, bachelor's degree from Baylor University, a master's, and a PhD from, what's it called again? Um, I can't remember the title. South, uh, what? Southwestern Baptist Theological Southwestern Seminary. Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. That's what I was going to say. Uh, uh, he is a wanted criminal in several countries. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's on the witness. Oh, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Get that. Um, uh, so he is here to talk to us about uh, this. This is a continuation of his discussion on Berkeley, right? Yeah, it's a yeah. Kind of. Okay, all right. Well, uh, that's all I have to say here. He's, he's an avid Pokemon Go player, apparently. So yeah. uh, all right, I will leave it to him. Great. Well, thank you. Um, this is um, it's it's listed as part two. Um, I'm not going to talk about the same stuff I did last time. I'm sure, here last time. I talked about Whitehall, I talked about Barclay being in America, why he was here, um, my experience there. I ran you through kind of a, a virtual tour of uh, the museum. Uh, today's lecture is a little more, well, quite a bit more philosophical. This is part of the work that I did, uh, researching, thinking about these topics, and this is part of uh, the results of that. So first I want to thank the Weatherford College community, the students, administration, my, uh, my colleagues. Um, doing philosophy is hard, being an academic is hard, but it's even more hard when, you're, when you don't have a research position. So you're trying to do research in, uh, at a teaching institution like ours, that makes it even more difficult. So I wouldn't be able to do this without the support of Weatherford College in these endeavors, and I, I really do appreciate that. I also want to thank uh, the International Barclay Society for giving me the uh, opportunity to go to Whitehall and do this research, as well as the Colonial Dames, the ladies who maintain, uh, own and upkeep, uh, maintain uh, the Whitehall Museum. This is a work in progress that I'm, I'm doing here, so uh, I ask you to keep that in mind. Um, some of these ideas are, are fresh and I'm still working through them. So I'm giving them to you um, for discussion, for, for uh, feedback. Um, I have tried to take a lot of the jargon out where I can, uh, but it is a philosoph uh, philosophy paper, philosophical paper, and there are some places where I do that better than others. So just uh, if you have questions about any of this stuff, please ask in the time I hope we have left uh, at the end. Right. So here we go. The uh, idealism, divine language, and the fact-value distinction, re-enchanting a fractured world. This past summer, I was accepted as a resident scholar at Whitehall Museum House in Middletown, Rhode Island. The house is the former home of the Irish bishop, uh, Anglican bishop, uh, then Dean, George Barclay, and now exists as a museum in his honor. The residency was for two weeks and required my staying at Whitehall, I was allowed to bring my family for those two weeks, and giving tours 10 of the 14 days that I'd be in residence. In return, I had access to both the Whitehall Barclay Library, maintained by the International Barclay Society, IBS, and the bucolic atmosphere that drew Barclay to Newport in which to read, study, and write. And during that time, I was able to conduct some research into my main professional interest, the intersection of Barclay's philosophy and that aspect of Christian cultural engagement that I refer to as cultural hermeneutics. The word hermeneutics means interpretation, so an interpretation of cultures, what I'm, I'm mainly focused on. This lecture is partially the product of my previous research I took with me to Whitehall and my efforts while at Whitehall to build on that research. I absolutely loved my, absolutely loved my time at Whitehall. Uh, it was life-changing from meeting guests, philosophers, and lay tourists alike, to meeting several of the colonial dames who take care of Barclay's home, to the extensive collection of Barclay-related material all gathered in one place, to the nearby beaches where Barclay once walked 
and the bishop's seat at Hanging Rock where Barclay sat and thought through his Bermuda project and wrote Al Safran, the only work he would produce while here in America. I look back on my time at Whitehall as a definite bright spot in my career to date, and I hope to be able to return for another residency sometime. On my second day of giving tours, a large group of Chinese students attending a summer program at Tufts University arrived with their professors. Nancy Kendrick, president of the International Barclay Society, and I each took half of the group on a tour of Whitehall. While their time was short, some of the best questions I received in my two weeks as a resident came from that group. One question stayed with me, and I've returned to it several times since my time there. That question, together with recent discussions I've had with colleagues and some students and an adjunct apologetics course at Southwestern Seminary, has served as a catalyst for my thinking about this lecture. The question, asked by one of the chaperone professors of the Tufts group, pertained to Barclay's goals in his proposed college in Bermuda, and was something along the following lines. Was Barclay, as concerned, to, was, was Barclay as concerned to convert students who would attend his college in Bermuda, colonists and natives, to his metaphysical views of idealism and immaterialism as he was to convert them to Christianity? So if you were here last time, you heard me talk about how Barclay came here to build this college to uh, instruct the native children and the colonial children uh, in Bermuda, that project fell through. He had 20,000 pounds promised to him, uh, the money was pulled out from under him, and uh, what he expected to be a lifetime lived out here in the Americas uh, as the president of that school um, was cut short to only two and a half years and he had to go back to Ireland. Barclay's stated goal in the Bermuda project is well known. In his proposal, the proposal by the way is called, this is the title, this was a pamphlet that he wrote. This is how they titled things back then though. The proposal was called, A Proposal for the Better Supplying of Churches in Our Foreign Plantations and for Converting the Savage Americans to Christianity by a College to be Erected in the Summer Islands, otherwise called the Isle of Bermuda. That was the title. So, you, pretty, you, you, know, you don't hide anything in your titles there, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> In his proposal, he specifically points to the ministerial education of the English youth and that the, quote, children of savage Americans brought up in such a seminary and well instructed in religion and learning might make the ablest and properest missionaries for, for spreading the gospel among their countrymen, end quote. The main goal of the college was to reclaim the moral integrity of society through the Christian faith. Though this main focus was a religious one, Barclay notes that other learning was to be given equal attention, especially to the Americans by whom he meant Native Americans, uh, or Native American youth, that is, which he distinguished from the English youth. Now, regardless of what you may think about Barclay's missional attitudes about the world, that they're imperialistic, culturally insensitive, or what have you, his outlook on the world was an integrated one. And I think that this observation could offer a kind of lesson for us in today's educational culture. As I considered the Tufts professor's question, I was immediately struck with the thought that Barclay would not have drawn the distinction between converting to idealism and converting to Christianity. Not because he conflated the two, but because the one automatically led to the other. In other words, Barclay saw the world and his intellectual engagement with the world in an integrated way. The reason he preached his idealism with what some might consider evangelical fervor is because he thought it led inextricably to God. Even his later endorsement of tar water is infused with theological significance. <coughs> in this lecture, I will consider from a contemporary Christian perspective how Barclay's philosophy, specifically his idealism and divine language theory, could be useful in putting our fractured existence back together. I'll be using the language of imagination and enchantment to make this point. I will proceed in four parts. I will begin by elaborating on what I take the problem to be, namely what Paul Gould calls the disenchantment of the world around us. This disenchantment results in a fractured 
way of perceiving and engaging the world described as the fact value distinction. Next, I will propose that a potential solution to this problem, at least for the Christian, lies in the work of the good bishop, George Barclay. In this section, I will describe and recommend the Barclayan view of idealism followed by Barclay's divine language argument for God's existence. These views create a rational space for the Christian to think about the world in a more holistic and integrated way. I will then argue that employing Barclay's view in this way results in a re-enchanted world and give examples of such re-enchantment. I'm not sure that I have many examples. I may not get to those, but that's where I want to go. Finally, for those sympathetic to the problem but unconvinced by the solution, I will conclude with a secular version of these ideas that may be pragmatically helpful in repairing a fractured, disenchanted view of the world. But first, what accounts for this fracturing? It's the fact-value distinction. We live in a broken and fractured world. As I just said, recent discussions with colleagues and students have made this observation even more evident to me. One of the things that drew me to a study of Barclay, and a major reason that I look up to him, is that he was more complete, less fractured, than the world around him. By contrast, it seems that a quasi-postmodern culture has divided the world into facts and values. In her recent book on culture and faith, Nancy Piercy states that in contemporary culture, there is an assumption of divided truths called the fact-value split. Such a split is the assumption that objective knowledge is possible, this is a quote, the assumption that objective knowledge is possible only in the realm of empirical facts, while morality and religion are merely values, end quote, where values simply refer to personal tastes and preferences. What is really at issue here, I think, is a kind of absolute fact-value distinction. Here are a few common examples of this distinction. You may have heard some of these. Well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. That's just your opinion. Who's to say? And as in, who's to say what's right or wrong? That can't be scientifically proven. The difference between a fact and an opinion is that a fact can be proven to be true. Opinions are merely someone's feelings about a topic. That last one, by the way, was taken from a third grade worksheet on fact and value. <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry, on fact and opinion, the distinction between fact and opinion. So you may look at these and think, well, what's the problem with those statements? Well, in my view, the problem with such statements is that they separate value from facts in a way that doesn't allow any meaningful engagement with either is my firm belief that separating these two is detrimental to society as a whole and specifically to education. Considering the, consider the following claims. These are all uh, claims about consciousness. Some of these I've heard very recently, actually. The brain is a complex computer and consciousness is its data output. It's the product of the brain. Here's another one. The brain is complex in ways we have yet to discover. Not really like a computer at all. Consciousness is its byproduct. Here's another one. Consciousness presents a hard, hard problem for scientists that science is not equipped to solve. Here's another one. The question of consciousness is a philosophical one and not a scientific one. Different one. The question of consciousness is a religious one, not a scientific or philosophical one. And finally, I am essentially a conscious mind, not a body. So those first three, by the way, are all from the scientific community in some form. I'll, I'll talk about that here in a minute. The first two I heard on the same program um, two different weeks. One week a guy went on and said the one that was the brain is a complex computer and consciousness is its data output. That's almost a quote. And then the other one was the week before that, somebody had gone on and talked about how the brain, I'm sorry, it wasn't the same program. It was the same radio station, NPR. The brain is, a, is complex in ways that we've yet to discover and that it's not really like a computer at all. So two, two scientists saying essentially the exact opposite thing here. 
But these are facts, right? Not values. These claims are all in conflict on some level. Some are claims made from the scientific community, some from the philosophical community, some from the religious community. Is it rational for students to hold more than one of these at the same time? Perhaps some of them are okay, but others seem to conflict to the point of an implicit contradiction. However, this is exactly where we find ourselves. Students in my classes are often willing to separate facts from opinions in ways that essentially commit them to holding contradictory views. And what's worse, they don't see anything wrong with this often, oftentimes. And because they've been taught that the distinction between facts and values is a foregone conclusion, they either happily do so, hold the contradicting views, or they are all too willing to jettison value in favor of the empirical. But notice that even the empirical is in conflict. The first three claims are claims from the scientific community in one form or another. How are sta students to navigate making sense of these kinds of conflicting claims without an appeal to philosophy? This is just an example from my field, and I assume there could be others, uh, many others from many other disciplines. Views that elevate science as the sole arbiter of truth effectively divide humanity, the value side of the fact-value distinction, from any essential human endeavor. Essentially human endeavor. In such scenarios, moral, aesthetic, or any other evaluative claims are simply meaningless at best. At worst, they are just false. But this doesn't seem right. We have good reasons to think that some of these claims, the, the moral, aesthetic, and evaluative claims, might be objectively true. But if this is the case, science can't be the sole arbiter of truth. There has to be more to it than that. The distinction is also um, readily seen in the distinction between religion and science. It's back to the fact-value distinction. Religion is seen as the realm of belief, opinion, and faith, whereas science is the realm of knowledge, fact, and reason. By the way, I want to point out that I don't see there's a problem with making the distinction at all. I, I, I think that there are ways and places where making the distinction is helpful. We should do that. It's making the, extension, the distinction in these absolute ways, these exclusively absolute ways. That's what I think. That's what I'm, I've got to beef about. Um, they are, in the words of Stephen Jay Gould, non-overlapping magisteria. This is science and, and religion. Each speaking to its own facts, truths, and conclusions, and not speaking to the other. However, such a fracturing can serve to disenchant the world in ways that stifle various axiological relationships we may have with rea reality. Specifically, we are suppressed with respect to imagination, perspectives on goodness, assessments of truth, and our experience of beauty. Furthermore, insofar as these things are important in understanding, exploring, evaluate, evaluating, inventing, theorizing, and simply thinking about science, or anything for that matter, in productive ways, we would do well not to separate fact and value so cleanly. Historically, discussions of the fact-value distinction have roots in David Hume's is-ought distinction. Hume's concern was a moral concern in which he cautioned that we not make the moralistic fallacy of deriving an ought from an is. What he was concerned about here is that here's the set of facts, and from these sets of facts, I can derive some moral claim. Given that this is the state of the world, this is what we ought to do. And there's some problem moving in that direction. We could talk more about that later, but I'm going to move on. <coughs> However, there is a converse naturalistic, there is a converse naturalistic fallacy in the neighborhood. Namely, the fallacy of asserting a natural scientific claim from a set of assumed moral intuitions. It's just the reverse of what I, I just explained. Um, given that this is what we ought to do, here's how nature ought to be, or is, or whatever. It should be noted that the problem is not that there is a distinction made between facts and values, I just mentioned this, but that such a distinction often results in a kind of valuation in itself, usually in the form of a preference for fact, or science, over value, 
morality, and religion. Such moves are problematic for reasons discussed and only serve to create a fractured experience of the world around us. But if we are simply material creatures, one might say, then it makes sense that science would reign supreme. Even if we have some kind of emergent soul, the sensory experiences of the world around us are surely ground, uh, sh surely ground us in a way that the arbitrary experiences of the mind or non-material self don't. So it, it must be the case, what I'm saying, somebody could object, wait, if I'm just a material thing, a material being, doesn't the material world ground me in a way that this byproduct of my mind, of my brain, this mind, doesn't it ground me in a way that that doesn't? But why give preference, why give such a preference to the material world? Why think we are simply material creatures? What evidence, to use paradigms familiar to those trading in the distinction, what evidence is available to us that the material world and not the mental world is all there is? Along with Barclay, I propose that we have more reasons to accept the non-material world than we do the material one. In addition, I think that such a shift in thinking might serve to repair our fractured experience of the world and re-enchant or re-humanize the world around us in ways that move us onward and upward in education, morality, science, and knowledge in general. So we're going to move on to idealism. Idealism is the metaphysical view that there is no mind-independent reality. Christian idealism is the view that m the mind on which all reality ultimately depends is just the Christian God. Barclayan idealism is Christian idealism plus immaterialism the view that there is no material substance. Thus, on Barclayan idealism, only minds and their ideas exist, with all of reality depending ultimately on God for its existence. Barclay offers a host of arguments in favor of his idealism, and there has been an explosion of analysis and exposition of these arguments in recent literature. Given time constraints, however, I will only be concerned to give a cursory summary of two of the most recognized arguments in favor of idealism and then focus on the related divine language argument that Barclay gives as evidence of God. So Barclay and idealism. Although there are many recent ways that scholars parse Barclay's arguments for idealism, there are two main arguments that Barclay scholars recognize as integral to Barclay's defense of his idealism. The argument against abstraction and the master argument. So first, the argument against abstraction. It is widely held that the basis for Barclay's argument against materialism is at least in part an argument against abstract ideas. Supposedly, abstract ideas are ideas, quote, that the mind can frame to itself exclusive of extension. Extension is a, a term of art and philosophy. It means a thing's taking up space. So exclusive of extension, a thing being out here, uh, abstraction is something that the mind can frame to itself, you can think about like color and shape, for example. So you think about the color red or the shape of a circle. You can think about these in some abstract way. However, this belief is seen by Barclay as an error in reasoning. He states that, if understood properly, what follows from abstraction is basically nothing. He states that, if properly understood, I'm sorry, I just read that. Uh, red is a particular color, for example. And to abstract is to rid an idea of its particulars. Thus, to abstract color is to think of no particular color that is still a color. So I think about color in general, not the color red, that's a particular color, but just the idea of color. Well, that's to think of color that isn't any particular color, and that's the problem that Barclay has. Um, the same is true of extended bodies of no particular shape, but still a shape. So you think of the concept of shape for example, or moving things of no particular motion that still move with emotion. These are, Barclay suggests, not easy to conceive. Essentially, Barclay is arguing that our ideas are based on the particulars that we experience. Furthermore, we can only have ideas of that which we do experience. Any ideas we have are of particular things and abstracts are by de definition not particular. Therefore, we can have no experience of abstract things. 
So once this conceptual framework is in place, we can't have a uh, concept or experiences of abstract things, Barclay drives home his point. Since material substance is an abstract object, we can have no experience of it and therefore have no reason to assume it exists at all. Thus the belief in material substance is based on unfounded assumptions. And it is this conclusion that prompts his famous essay is percipi, to be is to be perceived. The idea here is that if you if you think about objects out here in the world, there are all these things that we experience about the object, their color, their shape, their texture, all of these things. And um, when you strip all of that away, presumably we have some material substance that underlies all of this. And Barclay's saying, but we really don't have any experience of whatever that is, that material substance, because the only thing we experience are the color, the shape, the texture. If you take our ability to experience those things away, there's just nothing there, there's nothing left. Essentially, Barclay is arguing that our ideas are construed from particulars that we experience. Furthermore, we can only have ideas of that which we experience. Any idea we have, any ideas we have, are of particular things, and abstract ideas are by definition not particular. Therefore, we can have no experience of abstract things. In other words, if we follow an empiricist program for knowledge, by which knowledge is primarily what is experienced, then all of our experience is a product of sense perception. So think about that. If you, all of your experiences, all of your knowledge, if knowledge is just a deliverance of your senses, then everything that you know is just co comes through to you, just through those sensory perceptions. Again, using Lockean language, we only experience qualities of material objects. We can abstract general particular qualities, such as color and shape, particular colors and shape. Like I can think of the concept of red or the concept of round, right? I can think of those things. But doing so requires us to be able to instantiate those qualities. When you think of red, you're thinking of a field of red. You're thinking of a blob of red. You're instantiating it in some way. You're not thinking of it without any of these other uh, qualitative aspects. However, when it comes to material substance, that is, the substance that underlies all of our experience, there is no quality from which to abstract. I can't instantiate a generalized experience of material substance because I don't experience it. As such, abstraction of things I don't and can't experience is impossible. But then if abstraction in this way is impossible, so too is it impossible to think of material substance. This is because material substance can only be arrived at by the process of abstraction, if at all, since it lies beyond the realm of sensory experience. This is unlike imagining things that are simply beyond our ability to experience, but still, still in the realm of experience. Like, for example, the center of the Earth. I can't reach the center of the Earth, I can't experience it, but I could say, if I had the right tools and skill, I could, I could observe the center of the Earth and it would have these qualities that would allow me to, to sense it. As such, I can imagine what the center of the Earth would be like by extrapolating, abstracting generally, from experiences I have of other kinds of things. However, material substance is the kind of thing that defies qualitative evaluation. I have no experience of it because it has no qualities to experience. It is, as Locke claims, something I know not what. So that's the first thing, he gets rid of material substance through this abstract argument. Then we have the master argument. The master argument is a separate argument that Barclay takes to be a kind of final argument for idealism. In the principles, principles of human understanding, um, Barclay, uh, I'm sorry, principles of human knowledge, Barclay claims that so much argument in favor of idealism is really unnecessary when it comes down to it when the point could be made simply through a thought experiment. And here's his thought experiment. This is from Barclay um, directly. This easy trial may make you see that what you contend for is a downright contradiction. And so much that I am content to put the whole upon, the issue, uh, to put the whole upon this issue. If you can but conceive it possible for one extended movable substance, or in general for any one idea or anything like an idea, 
to exist otherwise than in the mind perceiving it, I shall readily give up the cause. And as for all that compages of external bodies which you contend for, I shall grant you its existence, though one, you cannot either give me any reason why you believe it exists, or two, assign any use to it when it is supposed to exist. I say the bare possibility of your opinions being true shall pass for an argument that it is so. What are you saying here? If one could but show him that it is possible to conceive of an idea that it is unconceived. Right? You catch that language. That it is possible to conceive of an idea that is unconceived. Then he would give up the whole idealism project. Whether the master argument is successful or not turns on how one constructs Barclay's argument from the principles and dialogues. But we don't have time to go into that. So we're going to move on. Hmm. It's enough to point out that others have pointed out that this argument is valid. There's some contention in the literature, but there are plenty who think that it is a valid argument, and um, that's enough to move forward for what, for what I'm trying to do anyway. Although the degree to which these and Barclay's other arguments are successful in showing idealism to be true is debatable, many scholars believe the bulk of them to be valid, if not wholly persuasive. Yet, for my purposes, it's not necessary that the arguments succeed to the degree of persuasion Rather, merely that it is rational for one to hold to Barclay ideal Barclayan idealism on the basis of these and maybe other arguments. Therefore, at this point, and for the purpose of speculation, it is enough to assume that their, su their success for the purposes of con considering the related divine language argument. So that's where we're moving to now, divine language argument. Uh, an interesting argument that seems to emerge from Barclay's idealism is what has been referred to as the divine language argument, or DLA for short. This implication of Barclay's views is well noted, though not often extensively discussed in the literature. Uh, Jorge Dicker notes, for example, that according to Barclay, visible ideas are God's language for telling us what tangible ideas we would have if we acted in certain ways. The groundwork for the ensuing argument is laid out in Barclay's previous work, most notably Principles in the New Theory of Vision, in which Barclay argues that vision constitutes a kind of system of signs and their relations to ideas. Dicker continues this quote, Barclay argues in detail that A, ideas of sight and ideas of touch are entirely heterog uh, heterogene heterogeneous. And B, ideas of sight have features that suggest to us what ideas of touch we will have if we act or move in various ways. Essentially, what's being said here, vision constitutes a divine language by which God communicates, among other things, his own existence to us. Indeed, on Barclay's view, all of nature is really divine language by whose means God communicates his intentions to us. Another philosopher, Roberts, rightly notes that such an understanding of vision as in divine language indicates that the world around us is rendered intelligible to us by our ability to approach the natural world as an appropriate object of interpretation. Without this ability, the world around us would be quite unintelligible. Think about not being able to make sense of your visual experiences, right? Not, not understanding what they are. There's a sense of interpretation um, involved there. DLA itself is found in the fourth dialogue of Barclay's Alciphron. That's, by the way, the work that he wrote while he was here in America. Given the signif uh, signification of vision, that the sensible ideas we perceive are arbitrary symbols of their meaning, we have reason to think of it as a kind of divine language. Euphronor, so you have two characters in the dialogue. Euphronor, who is the one arguing Barclay's position, and Alciphron, who is the atheist in the dialogue. And uh, Euphronor concludes, this is a quote from Alciphron, since you cannot deny, he's talking to Alciphron, since you cannot deny that the great mover and author of nature constantly explaineth himself to the eyes of men by the sensible intervention of arbitrary signs, which have no simil similitude or connection with the things signified, so as by compounding and disposing them to suggest and exhibit and exhibit an endless variety of objects differing in nature, time, and place, 
thereby informing and directing men how to act with respect to things distant and future, as well as near and present. In consequence, I say, this is the big point, the main point I want to point out. In consequence, I say, of your own sentiments and concessions, you have as much reason to think the universal agent or God speaks to your eyes as you can have for thinking any particular person speaks to your ears. So he's saying it's the same thing. The visual stuff that we're looking at is like God speaking to our eyes in the same way that you're hearing me speak to your ears. According to Kyoto Fields, philosopher Kyoto Fields, this argument has been interpreted in the literature as a kind of inference to the best explanation, a kind of abductive argument. Fields observes, just as other minds are posited as the best explanation of linguistic behavior, a divine mind is posited as the best explanation of visual language that Barclay defends in New Theory of Vision and summarizes in Alciphron. So if, you're, if you pick up a book and you read a story, you're going to assume that the story was written down by another mind, that a mind wrote this story. Now, an interesting question that's kind of lurking around here would be how close we are to artificial intelligence and a computer's ability to write a story that could fool us into thinking that it was written by a mind or something along those lines. But we'll leave those concerns aside for now. In any case, we could think of, you know, you read the story, you assume that another mind created that story. And, Bar and basically what Kyoto Fields is saying is that that's the same thing Barclay's saying about the visual world. You read this, these signs, these symbols in the visual world, uh, you interpret them, and it's reasonable to assume that there's something behind all of that, some mind behind all of that. Fields, however, disagrees that the argument amounts to such an inference, arguing instead that the argument constitutes part of a transcendental argument for God's existence. Transcendental argument says, here are, here are these things going on, and God is the best explanation for those kinds of things. So it's still a kind of abductive argument, but it argues back to this transcendent reality. There, can, there has to be some transcendent reality to account for the things uh, down here. So uh, the moral argument, for example, is often, often seen or explained as a transcendent argument. In order for us to have morality, what explains morality, there must be this grounding of God to make morality what it is. He argues that reading DLA as an inference to the best explanation rests on the mistaken assumption that such inferences were the general method of arguing from effects to causes when it was actually transcendental arguments that were standard. This is during Barclay's time. Sorry, this is where it gets a little technical. I'll try to get through this quickly. In contrast, Fields expresses the argument as a confluence of the passivity argument. Here's some stuff I haven't explained yet, so just maybe through context, I'm going to have some asides to explain these, but Again, I'm going to try to move a little quickly through this. Um, Fields expresses the argument as a confluence of the passivity argument, passivity argument that since my ideas are not caused by me, and since ideas must be the, pr the product of volition, right? ideas must be caused by somebody wanting to cause them, my ideas must be caused by a different agent than me. So I, the ideas must arise from someone. They don't come from me. They must come from someone else. That's passivity argument. And the continuity argument, that things continue to exist when unperceived by finite minds because the infinite mind, that is God, continues to perceive them. Again, all, all of this stuff is preceded on the idealism stuff, right? That's why we're kind of making these, these assumptions as we go through. And DLA, that vision constitutes a language made by a divine agent. So that we are left with the following valid argument. I'm going to read this out. Bear with me. It's not very long. But this is how the argument would work. One, if there were no God, then there could be no divine volitions. Volition is an intentional action. Two, if there were no divine volitions, then ideas of sense could not, be, could not have representational content. Again, this is all assuming idealism. If these things are ideas out here, then there would be no representational content to them if there were no volition, there were no divine volition. Ideas of sense do have representational content. When I see a chair, I know that it's a chair. I see a tree, I know that it's a tree. There's representational content there. Therefore, there are divine volitions. Five, therefore, God exists. So the argument's valid. That doesn't mean that it's true. That just means that those premises support that conclusion. Whether it's true or not depends on whether you accept idealism and we've already kind of argued for that. 
There is much more to this discussion about Barclays DLA, however, and I think there is enough, however, I think there is enough here to see in the DLA a possible remedy for, for the Christian anyway to a fractured existence by thinking of the world around us in terms of a divine language by which the good, the true, and the beautiful are communicated to us explicitly if we have the imagination and literacy to understand. All right. So we're in the home stretch here. We'll leave about 15 minutes, hopefully, for some questions. Reenchanting a fractured world. So how does this help reenchant a disenchanted world? The main point I wish to make is that seeing the world as a kind of divine communication from a Christian perspective infuses reality with a divine reality that influences how we engage the world to begin with. Whether I'm doing science, mathematics, history, sociology, literature, or whatever, there is an assumption that draws a common thread throughout each discipline. It is a text to be engaged and interpreted. But then such a view is fundamental to most humanities programs. We are humans, engaged in understanding, interpreting the world around us. Per Barclay and idealism and the divine language argument, all of reality is a text to be read understood and interpreted for others. We have this extraordinary ability to relate to each other, to empathize, to form connections. This ability begins with the ability to communicate our memories, experiences, and ideas in a way that we can understand and be understood. And this is just what the humanities is about. So I think that seeing the world as a text, specifically a divine text, re kind of brings these things together. The fact value isn't split anymore. We're pulling them together because the value is in the facts, right? They're, they're in common to each other. So by the way of conclusion, I'd like to address the most likely objection to this line of thinking. That, here's the, here's the objection. That's all well and good, but I'm an atheist or agnostic or non-Christian or other, right? And so I don't believe that creation constitutes some kind of divine language. Therefore, your project is useless to me. <laughs> Hopefully it was entertaining if it's useless. Not so fast, though, I say. Even if one doesn't believe there is a God sovereignly, supremely, and constantly making the world available to one's senses, as I believe, even if one doesn't buy that there is no mind-independent reality, as I believe, Perhaps there's something to salvage and take away from what I've argued. First, one may not wish to go full Barclay and accept his ontological <laughs> conclusions. You're going to have to trademark that, I think. <laughs> and accept his ontological conclusions that all that exists are minds and their ideas. But the more modest assertion that one's experience of the world seems evidently mind-independent seems true enough. So. Even if you're not going to say, well, there, there's no mind-independent reality, your experience of the world certainly seems mind-dependent, right, at, at, at the very least. If this is the case, it seems at least pragmatically useful to think of the world as a text to be read, interpreted, understood, and explained. And so far as there is anything good, true, and beautiful, our imaginations stand ready to do the work reading, interpreting, understanding, and for some of us explaining the world around us in ways that make us all part of the human conversation, bringing value and facts to the table, not as separate pieces of two different puzzles, but rather as a whole picture, rich with all that makes life meaningful and good. And that's all I've got for now. Thank you. I mean, I'm happy to throw things at you, uh, but you have to talk into this. You can't yell at us. It doesn't get picked up. Any questions? Well, I'll definitely throw this at you. Throw it hard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, you left something uh, unspoken. You said we'll talk about it later time. I hope it's okay. We can talk about it now. We're talking about artificial intelligence. Okay. Uh, and so, um, uh, my question to you is this: 
so artificial intelligence is rapidly being developed obviously and we've seen um documentaries where the artificial intelligence is actually creating music and writing poetry etc does that in any way take away from uh the philosophical foundations of what you just expounded on yeah um so ultimately i don't think so um because i think that fundamentally uh, any any time we find something beautiful or meaningful, we're going to see a mind behind it. So there's one of two conclusions that can be drawn here. Either the artificial intelligence is a mind, or the artificial intelligence is being used as a proxy for a mind. That is, it's being employed in some way um, to produce this thing and that there's some other mind driving it. And then on that score, there's two other ways you can think about it. The person who developed the artificial intelligence is the mind behind the developed art or story or whatever. Or ultimately, if that doesn't suffice, ultimately, um, and this is, I'm kind of partial to this view, that God is the author of all this. So there's, there's another aspect to this project that I didn't get to um, here. I've, I've presented it elsewhere. I think I presented it at the conference last year. but. It's this idea of divine imagination and our, our imaginations related to that. So uh, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, very uh, famously wrote an essay um, on fairy stories. And in this essay, he talks about primary creation, God's creation, and then sub-creation, which is our imitation of that creation. Mm -hmm. So proper sub-creation is going to have certain kinds of features, and we can see it marked out this way. Uh, if it turns out that an artificial intelligence is able to properly subcreate in some way, then that's just, I would say, further proof that there's a God uh, that has given this primary creation uh, in which we can subcreate and create these rich stories that are full of meaning and purpose and, and so on. Didn't you say that we are that subcreation? I think, th no, we are a primary yeah. creation. No, but we are AI, them? Yeah, I guess in a sense. Yeah, you could, if you want to shift it back that way, yeah. So if we are able to create AI that produces this stuff, then yeah, there's a sense in which we would be, we, we would be God's AI. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think that's quite the right way to think of it, but yeah, I, I see the analogy you're trying to draw. Um, the, on the imagination stuff, what I what I argue is the reason that we have good imaginations is because there's a perfect imagination from which we came. So uh, I'm not going to get the quote right. Tolkien says that we we make in part because we are made, and we are made with a purpose by a maker, which further points to the kinds of things that we make, which are purposeful and point back to us in some way. Um, at least the best of art does that. Um, it's a reflection of who we are in some sense. And I think the best of best art is a reflection of who we are as creatures of God. Uh, sir, yeah. Uh, in that vein, so we, uh, if you accept the premise that we're divine creations, is that uh, artificial intelligence, which did not take millions of years to develop and just came about within the mind of man recently, is that divine? Right, well, for, first of all, I wouldn't say it's artificial. I mean, that's just a, an analogy drawn. And second of all, I'm I'm uh, I'm more or less agnostic on the on the issue. So whether it took millions of years or whether it was a split moment product of, of divine appointment, I'm not sure either way. I mean, I have opinions about it, but I don't think they matter. Anyone else whose question I can I fail to answer? Just real quick, um, great job. Uh, Thank you. Is there anything in particular that you don't agree with Berkeley on uh, regarding all of his theology? Is there something that you're like, I, I can't agree with that part? Yeah, of so, so I think I, so there's some stuff that I put in here that wasn't quite Berkeley. And so this idea that there are certain kinds of abstractions that we can reasonably uh, draw from. I think that there are places in Berkeley where he actually gets to this point, but I don't think he explicitly does. I think he's confusing on this point. He seems to 
throw out any kind of abstraction altogether. Um, and I want to say, no, I think that there are you know, general abstractions that we can make. I gave the example of red, right? We, we can think about the concept of some things being red because I can instantiate it. And that's a kind of abstraction, a kind of abstraction. It's not really instantiated. It's just kind of instantiated in my imagination. But then these other abstractions that Berkeley talks about, I'm on board with that. These, um, you know, abstracting the concept of color, that doesn't seem to be a real abstraction. I can talk about color in this kind of abstract way, but it's not a real thing that I'm talking about. It's, it's just this, you know, this concept. Um, and that's okay when it comes to color and shape, but when it comes to material substance, which is supposed to be this real thing out there, that's where the problem comes. So, yeah, I, I think that there's some room to wiggle there. Um, uh, I have always uh, said in my defense of Barclayan idealism that I, I am a Barclayan in the way that I think about these things. I think that Barclay was essentially correct, but my... Um, my devotion is to the truth of the matter, right, and to pursuing that uh, rather than to Barclay. So if my view at some point diverges away from Barclay, that's fine by me. I'm not, I'm not too concerned about that. Is that your question? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and I, so I couldn't point to any particular things right now off the top of my head yeah. that I would say, he says this and I think he's way off base. Any other questions? I'm sorry, before, before that, I will, I will point out, though, that I mean, there are other aspects of this philosophy that I could point to. For example, um, Barclay um, wrote, a, wrote a really interesting tract called On um, Passive Obedience. Not passive disobedience, but passive obedience. And he makes a claim that uh, whenever there's a governing authority at all, that we have an obligation to abide by what that governing authority says. Um, so this would make him firmly in the camp of the loyalist, right? He would not have been in favor of the American Revolution. And I, I think that there's probably some pretty good reasons to rebel against authorities, um, even if they're not particularly abusive in overt ways. I think there are other kind of abuses that would warrant that. So, I mean, for what it's worth, right? And faithful disobedience is necessary at times, right? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except against God. Yeah. 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 So I have a question about this in terms of uh, the Greeks and their attempt at eudaimonia and Aristotle's. This is a you know a aggregate of sensual experiences. That's what's going to be happiness. Is in an idealism. You're telling there is an ideal form of happiness that would. Of course, you're talking about fracturing and, and putting it back together. If there's an ideal form of happiness that comes from him that we are waiting to discover if from we have not reached it yet. From God? From God, yeah. Um, to get to this eudaimonia, this ideal state of well-being. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, so I use the language of the good, true, and the beautiful on purpose. Right. That's right. The, the, so those are the classical... I ideal. <laughs> yeah, the classical... Um, um, ideals, yeah. Um, and um, I use those because I think that those are the values that are being split away from things, right? So we're not allowed to look at, now we can't, we can do this, but so if I'm a scientist, for example, and I'm in the, I'm in the lab and I'm working on something, um, I can, I can step out of the scientific mode and recognize that this thing is beautiful. But there's no sense in which that connects to the work I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's beautiful or not is irrelevant to the work that I'm doing. And that's where that split occurs. I want to say, no, that's, it's completely relevant to the work that's being done. Now, somebody might say, well, how does it change, right? If I split these, how does it make a difference in mm -hmm. how somebody operates? Well, it may not make a practical difference, but it certainly makes a valuative difference within the person, right? Mm -hmm. And this may kind of get to what you're asking. I think that 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 so the the one thing is coming to an understanding that certain interpretation of these values can be objective. Mm -hmm. If this points someone to God, then that's an ultimate reality that somebody is is being drawn to. That's that's a good. So you talk about this 
eudaimonia, the state of mm -hmm. eudaimonia. Mm -hmm. I think the closer we get to those truths and the closer we get to integrating that experience as I'm, I'm talking about it, then the closer we are to those, to what you're, you're talking about is happiness. It's, it's not unlike what Aristotle was getting at when he was talking about eudaimonia and virtue ethics and that kind of thing. It's, it certainly has that flavor. I think that Barclay would have been okay with that, although he do, I don't think he explicitly talks about that. Um, but I'll admit I'm a little bit ignorant of Barclay's ethics, specifically. I mean, I know about them. I'm just that wasn't the focus of my study. <coughs> so, does that? No, that's okay. that's, that's fair. Okay. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Trickett, and thank you all for attending the, the Whitehall Lecture Part 2. Thank you, everyone.